Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today, give us the grace to receive it. Give us the understanding we need to hear it and act on it, and help us to see our Lord Jesus Christ and all his glory through it. Amen. One of the things about getting older is that you're filled with memories, good and bad. You have a lifetime of experiences you can draw on. About 10 years ago, I spent some time talking to a 93-year-old man. His name was actually John, but he went by the name Jack. And one of the things that really struck me about this man was his love of stories. And most of his stories were about life as a youngster, living in the early 1900s Australia. And there's one story in particular that just stuck with me. And that's the story of his family moving from Ryde to Penrith. But his family owned a pig farm. And so he told me how his dad borrowed a buggy and a horse to move the pigs from Ryde to Penrith. And as I listened to that story, I couldn't help but picture trying to do that today. I can't imagine what that would be like today, trying to move pigs in a buggy that distance. Can you imagine uh, driving a horse and buggy up Menangle Road with pigs in the back? It's a story from a different world. But for him, as he looked back, as he remembered, this was a happy day. He remembered the fun as a youngster of moving these pigs in the buggy. Now, I'm sure all of you have experienced old men telling their stories. Sometimes they're funny, or at least they were the first half a dozen times you heard them. And sometimes they may even teach you something. Psalm 126 begins like that. It sounds like an old man remembering something from his youth, and he shares it with God in prayer. Let me read from verse 1. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We were glad. He's thinking back to a really happy day, a day when God had restored the fortunes of Zion, that is, Jerusalem. And he remembers how happy that day was, a day of laughter, a day of joy. It was so good that even the other nations had to confess, the Lord has done good things for them. And I think he's remembering the day that Israel was allowed to return home. After 70 years in exile under the Babylonians and then the Persians, they were allowed to go home. Now, I heard a story a couple of weeks ago on the news about a Chinese woman whose parents organised 10 blind dates for her. And one of the blind dates said, hey, have dinner at my house rather than eating out because I'll show you what a great cook I am. And so she did. And then that whole part of China was forced into lockdown. And so she ended up being forced to live in the same house as her date. Now, although she praised him for the way that he looked after her after four days, she also described him as inarticulate, honest, but didn't talk much. She said he was reticent like a wooden mannequin, but everything else about him is pretty good. I've been looking for an update to that story over the last week, but I just can't find anything. The lockdown has since been lifted, so I assume she's gone home. Can you imagine? How happy she would be to finally be allowed to go home after living with a guy who didn't talk much. How happy going home is. Wouldn't that be a happy day? And that's how the psalmist feels. But it's even bigger. Because he's remembering the day the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. Jerusalem, the whole town got to go home. His home. And as I shared a moment ago, I, I think this refers to that moment when after Babylon had destroyed Jerusalem and the Persian king Cyrus allowed the people to go home. After having to live away from home for, for 70 years, the Jews were allowed to return home. Can you imagine what that would be like? For most of the Jews, of course, they've never been there. They've grown up in Babylon hearing about this wonderful home where they used to live before the armies came. And now we're going there. It would have been a very happy day indeed. I tried to think of something in our time that might be like that. 
And the best I could think of was at the Second World War, where my grandfather went to war in 1940. Uh, he was captured by the Germans at Tobruk uh, one year later in 1941. He remained a prisoner of war until 1944, when the Italians, they just deserted their prisoner of war camps. They kind of left the war. And so my grandfather escaped with many others uh, into Switzerland, finally coming home in 1945. And can you imagine how happy you would be as a soldier five years away from home when you finally saw the Australian coast, when you finally made it to Sydney, when you finally got on that train at Central, when you made it to Lithgow, to Bathurst, to Cowra, when you got off the train at Cowra and you walked to Green, Greenthorpe and saw your family again. Can you imagine that joy? And that's why the person who wrote this psalm is able to reflect such joy. He's remembering the day his family, his people could finally go home. And I want to suggest to you that when times have been hard, and they've certainly been hard lately, it's good to remember good days. And I think this is one of the secrets to joy in the Christian life. And we are people who constantly reflect on that good day, the good news of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. So much so that life is not always joyful. In fact, most of the time it feels like a string of monotony with the occasional crisis. But we can keep joy as we think back of Christ. And so, friends, when we lose sight of the joy that's ours in him, it's good to remind ourselves who Jesus is, what he's done for us, and how much he loves us. Now, I must confess, when I think of joyful days, my thoughts are embarrassingly secular. I remember things like a game of paintball, where one time I stormed a wall and took out four opponents and single-handedly captured uh, captured that wall and saved our team. Or go-karting days, or a lap in a V8 supercar. I also remember things like wedding and birth of children or our holiday to Europe. And those things are great times of joy. And I want to say, don't expect your Christian joy to compete with that. See, one of the things about Christian life, it's not like a sugar rush of joy. When I think of my Christian life, there are a few moments like that. Perhaps my own conversion, or certainly some of the moments when people I've been sharing the gospel with have come to Christ. Or recently, Vanessa and I got to catch up with some old friends from Wollongong at the Riley's Place, people we were at church with there. We haven't been members of that church for about seven years, but what joy we had catching up with old friends. Some of those days are like a sugar rush of joy. But most of the time, the Christian life is like a settled, confident joy. The kind of joy that in the midst of this string of monotony, peppered with crises, leaves you settled with joy and security. The kind of joy that says, look, whatever may come, I'll hope in the Lord who has been so good to me. And that's why we keep every sermon, come back to Jesus. We're, We're in the Psalms today, but I'm talking about Jesus. 66 books in the Bible, all of them come back to Jesus because all of Scripture is fulfilled in him. Everything points to him. And so we'll keep coming back to him. We'll keep coming back to his death, his resurrection, because in those things is found our forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. In those things we find the joy of knowing that one day we will stand before God and because our debt is paid, we will enter into everlasting life. Jesus is the fulfilment of every passage of Scripture, all of God's plans for us, and all of our joy. So keep reminding yourself of Jesus, because in Jesus we're filled with joy. In Jesus we see our restoration to God. And that can be a great comfort when the world is falling apart around you. But here's the surprise of this psalm. This psalmist seems remarkably happy, but in fact he's not. He's remembering a joyful time in the past. But his life now is anything but joyful. And so we get to his request in verse 4. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Now the Negev is a rocky desert to the south of Israel. It is a barren wasteland. But I want you to notice he uses the same words in verse 4 that he's already used in verse 1. Restore our fortunes. God, you made us so happy before. Can you do it again, please? That's his prayer. 
You see, the life that they came back to in Jerusalem was very hard. And now they're walking up to the temple. Right? This, that's why this is called a song of the sense. It's a song they, they sing as they walk to the temple to worship God. So they're walking up to the temple and this song is a prayer. Grant us another happy day. Restore our fortunes again. Restore us like streams of water flowing through the Negev Desert. Now, I don't know if you've ever been fortunate enough to see a desert bloom. I must confess I've only ever seen pictures. But I know that there is a far distant, inaccessible country known as Western Australia. We can't go there. But I'm told that there are areas in that country famous for wildflowers that bloom after desert rains. A place that seems completely inhospitable and dead can suddenly spring to life. And that's a psalmist's prayer. We are like a dried out desert. Send your rain and restore us to life. And with that, the psalmist moves to stage three of his prayer, the imagining. He starts to imagine how God will answer his prayer. And this is a prayer of confidence in the goodness of God. Life is hard. I prayed for restoration and I know God is good. I know he'll answer this prayer. And so we read his imagining in verses 5 to 6. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Now imagine you have a bag of seed in a starving family. What do you do? You can eat the seeds, give your family the sustenance, the precious nutrients they need, or you can plant them in the hope that they produce a crop. Now, this is a time of shortage. There's not enough food. They're asking for restoration because it's hard. And so the sower walks along with a seed bag, throwing those precious seeds into the soil, wetting the soil with his tears because he knows what those seeds could be. As he sows, he cries and he prays to the Lord of the harvest. But then he's imagining, four months later, the farmer is walking through fields of luxurious wheat with shouts of joy. He takes out his knife and cuts off some sheaves, which he bundles and carries back home. This is the imagining of the psalmist. Just as things, just as things have been really hard, Lord, soon under God they'll be good again. And with that we see the second surprising thing about this psalm. This psalm was written during a time of pain in Israel, and yet it's a psalm of joy. Three times in this psalm we hear about these songs or these cries of joy. We're suffering here, but praise God. We're on our knees, but praise God. He will restore us. We've got no food now, but praise God, because we know that God has loved us, and we can be sure that he still loves us, and he will restore us. Well, this psalm can be a bit tricky for us to wrestle with for a couple of reasons. See, despite the supermarket shortages we have at the moment, we're not really familiar with food shortages. And apart from rapid antigen tests, we're not really familiar with any shortages. We're some of the most materially blessed people in the history of the world. And as we know, material wealth is a whole lot better than poverty, but it doesn't bring joy. It doesn't bring restoration. Our life is more than just stuff and food. And so we've all experienced seasons where with the psalmist we might cry out for restoration like streams in the desert. And for the same reason, our deepest desires, they're unlikely to be material. Our deepest desires are going to be for restoration. Restoration with people. Restoration with God. We feel crushed. We feel overwhelmed sometimes. We feel like we can't go on. And that is when we might cry out to God like this psalmist. And the second reason why this psalm is tricky is because the restoration that we receive from God is a whole different order. The psalmist is rejoicing for the restoration of Zion. We rejoice for Jesus, for our restoration to God and the restoration of all creation under him. He praised God for bringing a captive home to a rocky outcrop in a desert. We praise God for drawing us to himself by removing our captivity of sin. 
And while the psalmist prays for material restoration, surely our greatest prayer is different. What do we need? We need to keep going in Christ, in whom we have restoration. We need restoration in the face of anything that might take us away from him. So I'm going to pray that God would grant that to us now. Heavenly Father, thank you for the restoration that is ours in Christ Jesus. Keep us by your grace. Keep us from anything that will take us away from you. And keep us pressing on to maturity. Help us not to be distracted by the loves of this world. But rather, Lord, let us be overwhelmed with the joy that is ours in Christ. Amen.